Welcome everybody to this. This is the fifth talk in the Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Speaker Series. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking with Kayla G. Coleman from Percent for Art. I'm going to pass this over to the Executive Director of the Lehman College Art Gallery, Mr. Bart Bland, to introduce Ms. Coleman. So, Bart. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, I'm very delighted to be here to uh, welcome uh, Kayla G. Coleman uh, to uh, speak with us on a topic I'm passionately interested in, um, which is public art and the design process. Uh, Kayla is an art historian, a curator, an educator, and a writer who specializes in modern and contemporary art by Black artists in both the United States and the Caribbean. Uh, her work is rooted in topics that include access to post-colonialism and the intersections of marginalizations. Uh, Kayla, for many of our Lehman students watching, is uh, very much a product of CUNY and the CUNY system. Uh, she received an AS in gallery and museum studies and photography from Queensborough Community College. Uh, she received her BA in art history from Brooklyn College, and she is currently finishing her thesis uh, for an MA in art history from City College of New York. Uh, since beginning her career, Kayla has held positions at the Studio Museum in Harlem, New York Historical Society, White Box, and the Bronx Art Space, where I was lucky enough to get to meet her for the first time. Um, she's delivered lectures and panels at Wilfrid College, Brooklyn College, Bronx Art Space, and the New York African Studies Association. She's contributed writing and research for books and magazines and catalogs, including publications on Alma Thomas and Betty Saar. Uh, Kayla is currently uh, the Deputy Director of Percent for Art in New York City. Um, uh, uh, Percent for Art manages, uh, is managed by the city's Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, and the Percent for Art program has commissioned hundreds of site-specific works in a variety of media by artists whose sensibilities reflect, reflect the broad diversity uh, of New York City. So welcome, Kayla. We're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. I've been really excited about this. Thank, thank you, Bart. Uh, and also, I just want to take the opportunity to thank Bart for helping organize this entire speaker series. He's kind of My been behind the <laughs> winner. He's, he's been behind the scenes um, lurking. Really, yeah, lurking. Yeah, it sounds, sounds evil, but it's been amazing uh, working with him and impossible to do without him. So I just want to thank him for being here and for helping, continuing to help. Kayla, welcome. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, there's a lot to discuss uh, in the past. We've been, we had talked briefly uh, prior and we just had way too much to talk about. So I think today is actually gonna be really challenging just to kind of keep it to just a few things. But I thought maybe you could just start by just taking us through what Percent for Art is and what you guys do, what your role is in the city. Okay, great. So I prepared a few slides and I'm gonna share my screen. Sure. Um, okay. Cool. Why not? <laughs> So we usually like to, when we talk about public art um, at a percent panel, we love to start with this particular quote by Paul Ramirez Jonas, um, which is the art is here for the public and the public is here for the art. And um, we think that really solidifies what, uh, what we come to do, you know, in a gathering and a panel and also what, how public art and the public interface with each other. And I think it's something that should be kept in mind when you're thinking about public art. So what exactly is public art? Um, it is where the public space, art, and the community intersect. Um, these things are crucial to a public art piece and there is respect for all things. A little bit about the Percent for Art program. Um, we were founded in 1982 by which is the Percent for Art um, law, which says that 1% of initiated projects for reconstructions or new buildings um, must be spent on art and it provides employment opportunities for the creative sector. Um, a little bit about percent for art in numbers. Since 1983, we've done over 300 projects, 385 to the tune of 92 million. And today we currently have 138 projects in progress. 
all in different stages um, to the tune of 24 million. And here's a breakdown of our projects across all five boroughs as we commission in all five boroughs. We do not have a say in where a project goes. So there's nothing against Staten Island. We love Staten Island. Um, but you know, when these projects, we just get the initiation and we start. So we have no say in where they go. But as you can see, we have them in all five boroughs. And then here's a map to give you a little better idea of how these projects are spaced out. The dots in red are projects currently in progress. So we have a quite a large footprint in the city of New York. Um, a little bit about what goals we have at Percent for Arts. So one of our main goals is permanence. We want the project to last as long as possible. We say 40 years, but it can be longer. We want it to be longer. We want it to last. We think this is an important part of permanent public art is that it's there for generations. We want the work to be accessible. It's not public if it's not accessible by the public. And so that's, that's very important. We want it to be located in an open space where people can enjoy it. We value community participation in all levels of the percent for our progress um, process. And that looks different you know, at every stage, but we do value the participation of the community. Um, and we partner with local agencies to help these art projects come to life. Also, we value artistic diversity and that's twofold. We not only value artistic diversity as far as personhood, but also the artistic diversity in terms of the kind of art that is created. And, you know, in reference to materials and that sort of thing, we look at it all things. Um, we do our commissions by panels, and here is the composition of our panels. The panels are chaired by the Percent for Art Director, which is Kendall Henry. Um, and then we have voting panelists and advisory panelists. But even though it's, it's said like that, everyone in the room gets a chance to vote and everyone gets a chance to make a statement or you know, share anything in regards to the project. So we will have a representative of the sponsor agency, a representative of the design agency, a representative from the Percent for Art team, and then three outside art professionals. So they can be art historians, curators, artists, critics. Um, that's one of the ways in which the, um, the community participation comes in because we also look at hey, what kind of arts orgs are in that neighborhood or who are the stakeholders and how you know, will this affect them? Mm -hmm. the, and then we also um, are working with the architect and design team from the very beginning. That is very important. You cannot have public art without that input. So they go hand in hand. The public design commission um, and then our local elected officials. So that includes, you know, the council members, community boards. Sometimes we have to do presentations at community boards to let the community know that this project is coming to your community mm -hmm. and also the general public. Um, we will post these things on our websites when we're doing, um, you know, public, you know, speaking or any kind of meetings. And that is for the public to get involved, you know, so they can see what's going on and if they have an opinion about a project they can share that with us and then we have the timeline of a percent for art project now these things happen over a course of years you know anywhere from two to four sometimes more um so we start with the initiation and then we go into our curatorial selection and the initiation is when we get the budget, we get them, you know, everything's in place that 1% has been invoked. And now we know that we have a commission. Then we start in our curatorial selection. And it's not just the percent for our team that is putting together these selections. We do receive um, suggestions and if they're appropriate, we use them. Um, and in between all of these, um, you know, markers, there are other things that are happening. So 
we're also talking to the community at this time as well. We're letting you know that things are going on, especially when it's time to the first panel, that first panel where you know you saw the previous panel composition is where we will look over that list of artists and know sometimes it's a huge list, like you know, but we whittle that list down to finalists and those finalists will join us at the second panel and present a proposal that they made for this site, for this project. Um, the artists are selected on their past work. So like their past studio practice, or if they have um, a history in public art, but it's not necessary to have a public art history, you know, as an artist to be considered for a project. Um, once that finalist is selected, the, that artist, we then move into fabrication and installation, and then the work will belong to the community. This <laughs> is not goes as fast as, you know, I say it because there are other markers in that, within that, you know, pro process between fabrication and installation, which includes a focus on design. So then we go from, you know, your proposal is just a proposal. We then go into conceptual design then we go into preliminary design, then we go into final. And final is when it's actually, you know, the tweaks that have been made to this from proposal and conceptual, when you have, when that artist has worked in tandem with those architects and design teams to really get the nuts and bolts to make this project a reality. And that is it for... Okay. I actually have a question though. If you sure. did, I read this right. Ninety-two million in projects since nineteen eighty-three. Can you go back to that slide where you sort of sure. a brief history of percent for arts financial? Yeah. So the, right right after this, the the slide that's this one. Yeah, that's the one. Right. Okay. Great. So it says total 385 projects, ninety-two million since nineteen eighty-three, which actually doesn't sound like a lot of money. I mean, that is almost four decades, right? Uh, that doesn't seem, I mean, it's a drop in the bucket in some ways. Oh, absolutely. In yeah. comparison to what like these architectural projects will cost as a whole, right. you think there's, I mean, like it's only 1% and like 1% of a project that actually might have been 92 million to make that sure. one building. So, so, you know, it's like that budget is, is small in comparison to, yeah, that then, larger. But, but then I see under today, it says 130 projects and 24 million that you're, you're in progress, right? I mean, that's, that's almost like, a, that's a, a little over a quarter, just right now in progress is a little over a quarter of the total budget since 1983. So it, this seems like incredible progress. Am I, am I reading that wrong? Yes. Um, well, also there are different levels and different budgets. Like, you know, our school projects when we, we work with, um, actually I'm the one who, who does the most with the school projects now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we work in tandem with um, the school construction authority, particularly public art for public schools. Those projects um, usually have a much smaller budget. So, okay. Okay. And that budget usually starts at 50,000. So 50,000 in comparison is not, you know, a big amount of money, but you can do a lot with that. Right. So the projects add up. So I have a question um, in general. Um, why, is, why is public art important in, in your mind? Like, why do you, why would you defend it if you, if you were asked to? Um, I suppose I'm okay. asking you too. <laughs> um, that's actually a really good question. So why would, why is public art important? Mm -hmm. I feel like public art is important because of the way in which art is regarded in this country. So a lot of what I do is, you know, motivated by this idea of access and access to me means, you know, that everyone gets a chance. Everyone gets a chance to be exposed to these things. And we know that that's not true. We know mm -hmm. that, you know, in this country, access is a huge problem. Access, diversity, inclusion 
equity is a problem. So in public art in its very basic idea and its very grounding is literally for everyone. You do in like you don't have to have a certain kind of education. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to pay a fee. It is there for you. Mm. It's just there. And yeah. like you can interact with it however you choose. And I think that's um really important. I think, you know, because so much of what we do and who we are in this country and like just our very lives are super impacted by creative processes and I think it's often overlooked yeah it's almost I mean the way you describe it is it's there there you know that's also the same language that people use critics of advertising would use to describe advertising right it's just there it's on the bus it's on the sides of buses it's on billboards it's on our televisions it's on our screens it's everywhere and we're almost like in a toxic environment because of it and I the way you describe it makes me think of a public art almost as like a corrective for that like here's something that doesn't exist to sell us a product it just exists to elevate an idea or a concept or a, a, a people in general the human spirit you name it and I it doesn't yeah. yeah just make it's, life more beautiful I mean which is the whole purpose that I became an artist and a designer so I'm all for that. Um, hey, Kayla, do you think about uh, the the at DCA this as sort of an outdoor an outdoor museum or a museum sort of uh, as the collection as a whole? Uh, are you curating towards that with sort of an eye of of what is already in the in the uh, percent for our collection? I never ever really think about yes and no. Okay, so that's a layered question. Yes, I think that the entire city of New York is a museum and you can spend time going through different boroughs or in your own borough in your neighborhood and you can find something that's beautiful. There's art all over. However, um, I think of the collection as a living, breathing thing. So in it being a living, breathing thing and the goals which, you know, are to create things that last, um, and create things that are accessible. I think that the influence of the past helps us to create or commission projects um, that will, you know, start to speak that different contemporary language. You know, a lot of public art in the past, and even so many things, you know, in our collection is are focused on, you know, some of those older artistic principles, the bronzes, the figurative works, the allegorical pieces. And that's not to say that those don't have value, they do. But the world is different and the world is constantly changing. And I think that creates a void that can be filled by different practices. And you know that diversity I was talking about extends to the kind of art that's being created. You know, it may be we're moving away from the soldier on the horse um and we're getting different ideas of what public art can look like and i think that's that's amazing yeah i was thinking i was hoping you could maybe somehow talk about this what's been going on in public art uh in the last well it's been coming on going on for a while but just in the last few years with statues coming down and 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 a little bit about the history of at least public art in the city um, from your perspective and like how it's sort of been shaped by history and whether it's been considering uh, diversity or how it's been considering diversity. Do you have any insight into the history of it? Um, well, a lot of public art in general, New York and beyond, mm. is often contested and often, you know, will have certain opinions yeah. Um, and certain responses from the public. And so I think there with um, statues being taken down, which I think is totally valid. And I think a revision is necessary. And I think that, well, that is not me speaking as deputy director present for art, but that's me speaking as a human and, you know, as a person 
whose life is impacted by the things that I see. And I, for one, you know, I used to live in the South. I lived in Virginia and I went to high school in Virginia and living there <laughs> was an experience. But um, <laughs> when you live like, you know, in another place, and especially a place that is like, you know, America and just is such an interesting country is because it's founded on these kind of principles, you know, that people can come here and they can be welcomed here. And it's, you know, this right. scrap, scrappy immigrant story, blah, blah, blah. However, you don't always feel good in a situation or in a place that doesn't make space for you. And it's hard to feel good walking past Confederate monuments. It's hard to like, you know, like, especially as, as a black person, it's hard to feel good about that. Um, I personally don't think that's anything to celebrate. Confederacy is nothing to celebrate. So I, you know, eh. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, those things need to come down. However, it's when they, we're talking about this revision and the arguments, because I've heard all of them, yeah, you know, sure, sure. you know, and then and when you talk about these things and we're starting, you know, well, we're, we're past starting, we're in deep, deep in this conversation. And the historical precedent of it. So when you talk to people in the South, um, they, and especially those who like, you know, have that kind of Confederate pride. Mm -hmm. um, there's a word for that. I'm not going to use it. <laughs> um, <laughs> they love to say heritage, not history. You know, that's, that's like their byline. Mm -hmm. This is heritage. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's who we are, but who you are is steeped in principles that are actually super anti-American. Mm -hmm. When you think about the very basis of what like, you know, America is supposed to be. So with that in mind, um, you gotta, you gotta like, you know, really start to make those decisions for yourself. Me, I personally believe that revision is necessary. Revision is necessary in most things, especially as a historian. Um, because you realize certain things aren't being told and there's like gaping holes, like gaping holes in history, but also with this kind of art being prevalent, you're realizing that there's gaping holes in representation. Mm. And I personally got into art history, like how I found my, my way into this, this career was because I was looking for myself actually like I was looking for me and I was living in a place where I didn't really see me there wasn't really a lot of diversity and I wanted that like I was like well like where are the black people and that's <laughs> and it's like you know a very particular kind of experience that like you know I don't think is is mirrored the same way oh, well, I don't know so you guys can tell me but I don't think it's mirrored the same way, like from a white perspective. Like, I don't think white people ever have the opportunity to feel uncomfortable with being the only white person in the room because it's kind of like in America, whiteness is the base. Whiteness yeah. is like that, you know, median. So it's always kind of like, you know, everybody else is an outsider if you're, you're not that. Um, and so in looking for myself and trying to find myself and also like, you know, like just wanting to see like representation because like, you know, it's like, I know like black people exist clearly, but um, <laughs> it's not always, and it's not that way in history. We don't see yeah. it that way in history. And it's like, I remember being an undergrad and learning everything and he spoke about this briefly you know i know so much about picasso and warhol and i can name you know these these white male artists and i would i remember reading my first art history textbook a survey and i was like where are all the black people like yeah. do black people not make art i know they make art i'm from harlem you know it's like 
Um, but that like got me to thinking and these perspectives were missing and I know they exist. So I was interested in, in like seeing myself and that's like a particular course, you know, like when you make a decision to step outside of like a kind of established historical narrative, that's when you really start to learn things. Yeah. And it's like, and, and that's something that's taking place on a parallel. So for me, it was like, I was learning about Western art history at the same time looking for these other narratives and these, it started to actually intertwine and I'm realizing, hey, this is a gap, you know, in this history um, where these things were happening simultaneously. And if we talked about these things in tandem, there could be some new perspectives, but we don't, so. Right, I mean, that that's actually a very good answer to a very difficult question. Um, I, you know, at the same time, I always thought of, or I have been increasingly thinking about statues, like the, the statue as, as sort of a, a colonizer's idea, right? I mean, they, statues, they come from like Western art and anyway, and in many ways, and like the, you know, these idealized figures um, and, and they, they kind of like are there to state to stake a claim on, on space, right? Like planting your flag. Exactly, right. So I think, sorry about that, I'm getting excited here. I think that that right there, that paradigm of planting a flag is a colonizing idea like that itself could be interrogated. How is um, and also the flip side of that is, you know, gallerists, especially in New York, but all over the world, have been thrilled with black artists for decades now. And and they've you know they there are many famous black artists in the gallery system, um, and and they're kind of having like a renaissance right now, which is amazing. But that's the gallery system, which is also has its own sort of establishment, you know, uh, code that goes along with it. How is public art different from those two things, from like the art of the colonizer and the gallery system? Where does public art sit? Like, what's its distinct value proposition? If you have to put it in those terms. I am going to try to answer it. Um, unfortunately, the art market is such a huge influence on everything because it's like, we'll see the things that sell. How long does it take for the things that sell to wind up in the museums? And, or we, you missed one thing. And I think that's important to talk about is the academy. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the market, but how does the academy, you know, and the market speak to each other? Because the academy is creating these artists that are being funneled into this market. Right. And even thinking that you have to follow that particular model. And we've all heard it, you know, like in our respective careers, I wish I could tell you that, you know, how many times I thought there was only one way to do what we do or like one way to exist um, in this, you know, field. And I thought that I would literally spend my life in libraries and teaching. And, you know, I taught for over a decade and I, I and it was good work, but there are so many different ways that you can do what you do. And there are so many different avenues you can go through. So one thing I can say about public art and, and I think in my, and you know, the way I consider commissions is that I'm not really influenced by the gallery because I feel like I'm more influenced by the quality of work. And if this is a piece that, you know, will meet those, those goals that, or like, or is this an artist who can meet those goals? Um, is there diversity in this artist's practice? And, you know, I think about things like permanence and materiality mm -hmm. and, and those kind of things that influences me. And also the, the brain, the concept, like the role of the artist designer in this is so strong because there's a whole world going up or going on in your mind. There's so much. And there's like the influences are just off the charts. There's so many ways you can get influences through other, you know, art practices, like, you know, exploring other art practices, like 
you know, listening to music, watching film, reading, but also just like your daily interactions, experiencing new cultures, experiencing new foods. And I'm interested in how an artist can take the sum of everything and create a piece that responds to the site and -hmm. responds to the need. It also sounds like what you're talking about, I mean, you even mentioned this, this accessibility is really important. Absolutely. And, you know, and we actually had, I mean, in the first part of this, this lecture series, we spoke with Laura Silva, she's an accessibility designer, right? That's her job. Um, and I guess my question would be is, from your perspective, how do you design for, for accessibility when it comes to public art? Well, there's that physical level of accessibility, like, can you see it? Mm. Um, is it, you know, is it something that you can actually engage with? And then there are those other ways to be accessible. It could be, you know, braille on a plaque. Mm. So someone else can learn something about it. It could be, you know, having literature in multiple languages. Ask you about accessibility. I mean, is there also the sort of question of accessibility with the kind of art that's used? I mean, we had talked earlier about abstraction being in some ways more difficult for the public to accept because even a hundred years into abstract, hundred plus years of abstraction, there's kind of a stand back of what does abstraction really mean? As opposed to a statue where like there's a guy on a horse people kind of have a, come with a predefined notion of what that is, as opposed to sort of maybe some more challenging kinds of art that, are, that people are, are less comfortable with if they're not trained in that field. And, and that's the thing, you know, that's something that I kind of just dis, really dislike about our um, work is that I meet people and when people ask me what I do, and you know, I'll be like, oh, um, I'll, like, I, I don't go through all the many things. I'm like, oh, I'm an art historian or I'm a curator or something like that. And then, you know what I hear so much? I know nothing about art. People tell me that all the time. I don't know anything about art. I'm like, oh, do you? You, you don't think you know anything about art? <laughs> and like, you know, that usually will open up a conversation. Mm. And, you know, some, and I, you, I live literally, I can see outside of my bedroom window, the Swing Low piece by Alison Saar here in Harlem. Um, it is a work of Harriet Tubman and it's, it's quite a beautiful piece. And I, you know, I sometimes will go out on my, you know, my fire escape because we're in quarantine <laughs> and I sometimes need air and I'll watch the people like, you know, walk through that little plaza and walk around the sculpture and like really like, you know, take it in. And in those cases, like, hey, you may not know what this is about, but if you spend some time and really engage with the piece, if it piqued your interest, you're gonna do all you can to find out. Mm -hmm. I do it all the time. Like, um, you know, since we're in a global pandemic, a lot of my, you know, looking at art is a big part of what I do. The looking, the experiencing is a big part of what I do. And that has changed now that we're in a pandemic. And with that in mind, the way, I consume art is different, I think, because it is a consumption. Um, I think that, you know, it used to be me going into, you know, I'd go to a gallery show, I'll go to a museum, that sort of thing. But now it's kind of like, I'll see something or I'll hear something or I'll think about like, you know, I saw a really beautiful blue the other day and that got me thinking about, you know, artists who use pigments in a, in a really exciting way. And then that will like take me down the rabbit hole and I'll like really start like building up references and it's always a giant reference list that's purely unmanageable. I don't, I sometimes don't know how I'm able to, you know, put these things together, but and it doesn't happen for every piece. So I don't want people to think, oh, you know, I just gotta go see some public art, walk around it and I'll get it. It doesn't happen for every piece. It doesn't happen for me for every piece. And I don't love everything I see. Um, but I think, you know, it's really based on your interests and your drive to know more. So if you went and you saw, like you, you were just walking through downtown Brooklyn and you saw something you thought, oh, that's really cool. And then you're like, hey, well, 
you might snap a picture of it and put it on your Instagram, right? And then somebody's gonna comment, hey, this is blah, blah, blah. And this person did this and you should look at it. It happens to me all the time. I sometimes will just read the comments and learn things that way. And so, and one of those things also is that like, I remember when I was studying photography and I remember when I was teaching photography, I would always tell my students, there's no such thing as an innocent image because you're always gonna bring all of your experiences to everything that you do. And so with that in mind, that's going to create another avenue of potential exploration. So I hope I kind of. No, no, I, no, I, I, well, I have a follow-up. I, I th there's a huge thread in digital media art, uh, like from the 70s, 60s to now, and, and really design as well, that is just focused on accessibility, like telepresence and virtualization and, <laughs> There's art that just exists on people's phones that you you can experience a real place, and there's like this digital layer on top of it. Uh, how how were those things represented in in the world of public art? Do they I mean do they have the same kind of reach in your experience, like digital media work and technology art? No, and I wish they did. Um, that's actually like my dream is to figure out how to create public art installation, well, public permanent art installations that really, you know, embrace technology, right. but it's permanence, so hard to yeah. do. Yeah, permanence is the question, right? Permanence, exactly. It's like, yes, these things can, we see it, you know, you ride the train, you'll see the light boxes and that sort of thing. And those things are beautiful, um, but there is, they're not permanent. And they're not permanent because technology will change but also the level of maintenance that a technological piece requires. And that's like, you know, it can be real complicated sometimes where it's a whole system of lights and bells and sounds. And then it can be something that is strangely advanced, but also kind of lo-fi. Like I've seen some amazing pieces that are like, oh, this feels like we've turned a page, but it's not really any like kind of like, you know, technological advancement at all. So it's the permanence, I think. It can exist, the, the marriage of digital and art, but it will not be permanent. And I haven't figured out, <laughs> I don't know what that will look like in the future, but I wish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a there's a question here from the audience, and it's about criteria criteria for picking uh, works. And I know that you sort of went through a rather lengthy description of how things are chosen, and it's it's a it's a you know it takes group thought and and um, but the question is, what are your top three criteria for picking a piece of art for I, I presume for installation? Okay, that's actually a great question. Um, we seek art that is made of durable materials. Um, we are looking for work that is, how do I say? Um, we want work that really will fit into that artist's sensibility. So, mm. and we want work that will fit into our collection as a really great, you know, example of a contemporary representation. And I think that can be a complicated question. You know, I think from what the criteria will be, the next question is usually, well, what kind of artists apply? Or like, what kind of like artists look at these opportunities? Or what kind of artists are you guys particularly looking at? And we, look at all kinds of artists. There's no geographical barrier. There's no, and then one thing I can say about New York City that I may not be able to say about a lot of other cities is that New York City is an international city. Mm. So it's a twofold relationship. Not only is New York City is an international city, but New York City is also the art center of the world. Mm. So with that being said, it's a huge responsibility to commission art that not only is contemporary and beautiful and you know has that permanent 
you know, quality and meets all those markers, but also the kind of artists and the kind of attention that the program gets. Mm. Kayla, are you doing RFPs by the pro project by project? Uh, can people apply to do a, a certain thing or how does that work in, the, in terms of the process of, of gaining access to the, the system as it were? Mm. Oh, well that's, um, we have a registry so on our website, and if you put percent for our Department of Cultural Affairs or nyc.gov, you will definitely find the percent for our page. We have resident, um, a reference there, which will allow people to sign up for our registry, you know, put in their samples of the art that they've been doing. Um, we do post our RFPs when we have them. Um, and it is project by project. Um, it's okay. not like we're just going to put all of them out there and then people are just going to go ham. Um, also, another one that people can sign up for is the Public Art for Public Schools Registry, um, which is can be found on nycsca.org. Um, I'm going to put these in the chat window. So With the School Construction Authority and yeah, getting see. on their registry um, is also yeah. a great thing to do because they you know, they do public art as well. When we were talking about the collections and curating within the collection, I mean, I would think that one of the things that sort of stepping outside of the marketplace would be very exciting is that you can give a fairly major commission to a fairly new artist. Is that right? I mean, you can really shape someone's career by uh, bringing them into the public art fold. Can I tell you how much I love working with emerging artists? Like that is something that I truly love and I think, yes, absolutely. And that's something that I definitely want to make clear. If you come out of this with nothing else, please know that there is no real qualification to do public art. We work with artists all the time who have never done a public art project. That's what I'm here for, to help you through this process. Um, and, or people who are like, oh, I'd love to do a public art project, but I've never worked with materials like that. Or, you know, I've never done anything permanent. And, and those are things that we think about, like, I will look at a, an artist like I, you know, putting, we're, a lot of our projects are coming off the of pause. So I'm putting together panels now and I'll look at an artist. I look, let's say this artist works with paper. They create paper sculptures or they do interesting collage or something. I will look at that person's work and I'll be like, I wonder what that person can do with a more permanent medium. Like, so what could that person do if they had access in a budget to work with ceramics or to work with metal or, you know, something like that, you know, just because you've never done it or you don't have a reference point for it doesn't mean you can't. It's, a good point. that's the access. That's it's the, that's know, the beautiful yeah. thing about public art is that like, you know, there is literally something in there for everybody. And you work with fabricators where you could just speak a, a little bit. You had mentioned that about translating an artist's mm -hmm. vision. Oh yes, and that's that's the thing. It's not just me. Like I am not. <laughs> I do not have all of that. Like you know, technolog like you know, technical knowledge to be like, hey, this is what you do. But yes, we do work with fabricators, and we do you know, like when we give an artist orientation, and the artist orientation will happen after that first panel, and those finalists have been selected. We give them the orientation. We give them as much information about the project the site, everything that we have, we give it to them so they can respond and create a work that's site specific and fits that. And one of the things that we give to those artists is, and we call it the artist service list, is a list of fabricators and vendors that you know we've worked with in the past and you know we've had a relationship with, but it's a living document. So it's all, always being updated and changed and you know, fabricators go out of business, fabricators expand, you know, so it's always being updated, but it's a good place to start. It's it's a little Bible. It's a really great place to start, especially if you've never done anything like this before, but you're not married to it. So if you've been working with a fabricator and, or you know somebody and you're like, oh, this is the vendor that I like to use, go for it. Like you're not married to that list, but sometimes people need a good place to start. And that's a great place to start. And that marriage, you know, that happens like, I tell like, my artists, I'm like, you know, okay, you're creating a proposal. So you should look at this fabrication list and 
get some quotes, get some ideas, you know, figure out what kind of medium you would actually like this work to exist in. Like, and that's something that's actually growing, you know, we'll see there's so many new materials, you know, being created and being discovered that I'm sometimes just like, well, you tell me, <laughs> like, how is this going to look? Um, but yeah, so it's like, once you find that fabricator and then you begin talking that language and like what that fabricator will do is figure out how to take that practice that you do on paper and you've never really worked in a permanent material before and figure out how to take that and make it yours and make it you and your sensibilities and your talents still shine through, but it's just in another material. So it, for those of you who are watching a recording of this in the future, uh, <laughs> I feel uh, I have to mention that this is two days after the 2020 election. So I, you know, we're in a, we're in a tense situation here, but um, I do think it, it's important to ask you, Kayla, what do you see for the future of public art, depending on the, you know, is it is it really tied to the political currents in the in the country? Will we will we have something like a, a new iteration of the WPA in the future? Like, what do you, what are your thoughts on that on the future of public art? Well, I know that the future of public art will be super inclusive. I know that for a fact because we're already seeing it. We're already seeing it. There will be more women. There will be more people of color for sure. Um, Lava Thomas just got her commission in um, California, which is amazing. She's mm -hmm. going to be doing the Maya Angelou mm -hmm. um, monument and memorial, whichever. Um, <laughs> but I think that that's really exciting. We're seeing more of that now. We're definitely seeing more of it. Um, as far as the WPA, I feel like as much as I would love to see another iteration of the WPA, just um, for the sake that, you know, I'm surrounded by WPA art. A lot of like my foundational visual language is WPA art. Um, Harlem is a hotbed for it. And that's where I'm located. Right. Harlem Hospital Murals, like there's so much here that is, and it creates opportunities. And that's the thing, it's like, we, had, we're in this really weird career or field in which people value the arts, but they don't always know how to value the arts. <laughs> like, okay. so they'll give opportunities, but they don't compensate enough or they'll, you know, or it's just not, to the you know extent that it should be you know if people use design so heavily in their life and they don't even realize how difficult their lives would be without it so i would love to see something in which people are celebrating art and you know actually letting it do what it's supposed to do because art has a huge job in that it's yes it does all these things where it can be beautiful and it can be ugly and it can be you know, thought provoking, but it also is a document of our lives and how we live and, and, you know, the things that are happening in the past and also the hopes for the future. There's so much wrapped up in art. So yes, I would love to see, I do not know what that would look like. I don't yeah. know if it would be like federal on down. Um, but I think that it's, it would be, it would be a wonderful thing because also art is super devalued. Like we saw this in right. the Trump administration with the removal or the underfunding of NEA and things like that. And like so much comes from, like so much happens with that funding. So much emphasis has been removed from the arts and put on more like, you know, STEM, which is super important too. And we love STEM and it benefits our lives, but, um, there's room for a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And also <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, I'm literally, you know, thinking this out loud. Like yeah, you yeah. cannot have these STEM careers without these art careers because they speak to each other. Right. 
Cal, I just wanted to ask you because David has asked all of our other panelists and it's been kind of a running theme because we have a lot of students watching um, a little bit of, about your own career and how did you get from point A to where you are now and I think a lot of people are curious about that because you know arts administration is a hard field to break into so I just wanted to hear a little bit of your story if, if we could. Yeah. Oh well I did not come into the arts thinking well I was supposed to be a doctor that's first and foremost. I was supposed to be a doctor and I am clearly not a doctor, but um, so like, you know, I just, my heart wasn't there. I was a former science nerd. Um, I was majoring in psych, double minoring in chem and bio. Like I had an internship at a morgue. Like I was really going to be a doctor. Like that was like, that's wow. what I thought I was going to do. And I took this one gen ed art history course i was living in virginia at the time and it it was and it was always there like you know i realize now that like my interest in art was always there i just needed you know to experience it in a new environment and when i did it kind of like really opened up my mind and i realized that you know like there's something there worth studying there's something there um you know worth further you know investigation so i moved to new york <laughs> it was when i look back at that move i would not have done that with the budget that i had it was definitely like a young person thing you know like when you're younger you, you take risks and I'm, i mean i'm still young but like there it was risky um I worked for a little while, pay off my, you know, med, you know, my pre-med student loans. And then I just like really decided like, you know, Kayla, this is your life and you have to go for it and do what you really want to do because you only get one and you can't live it for someone else. So I started, you know, really studying and I was, you know, while I'm studying, I'm, you know, cause no one ever goes to school. Like I I don't know anyone who just had the opportunity to just go to school. You know, so I was working too and really, you know, putting myself in these like, you know, different environments. I interned and I do not, you know, appreciate the intern model <laughs> as someone who did internships because a lot of them are unpaid and unpaid internships are not cool. I wanted to be a curator. That was my thing. I was like, I, I wanna, you know, be a curator and I want to get a PhD and I'm still thinking about the PhD but um I took a curatorial I took a a um interview for a curatorial internship at a major museum here in New York City and I'm not going to say the name of it but I got told that I they weren't sure if I had curatorial vision and that kind of like hurt my feelings. I was like, hmm, like I would like, I really had to like take that in and like think about it, you know? And I did, I sat with it for a while and I was like, well, you know what, Kayla, like the model doesn't really work for you anyway. So the model is that you, you're, you get this curatorial internship and you know, maybe they love you and you're lucky enough to secure an assistant, you know, role and you're just doing administration work and it might be three years, four years before you're even allowed to touch an exhibition. Mm. I was like, that model doesn't really work for me. So um, I'm gonna continue to expose myself to other things and you know, carve out a career. And also I looked at you know, other people that I admired in the field and you know, looked at what they did. So you know, one of like my art heroes is Lori Stokes Sims and you know love her I love everything she does <laughs> and um I like you know looked at you know her career and what she did and I was like oh there are certain things that I'm not you know in the position to do yet but there are things that I can do and you know with that in mind I just started to take ownership of my career and like put myself forward and so and everything was a building block like everything was a building block like I didn't just like walk in one day and decide 
Kayla, you're going to be director of Bronx Arts, Bronx Arts Space. No, that didn't happen to me. I like, I had to take another job, you know, as a manager. And before that I was doing something else. And it was literally just building and building. And like, one of the things that I got really lucky in as far as doing administration work is that I learned how to write grants. Mm. Learning how to write grants changed the whole trajectory of my career. Cause when in like, and even now, like I've been working with, you know, people in quarantine, like giving advice as far as grant writing and, you know, ways to do that. Because if you're a good writer, you can do a lot of things. And writing grants really was a way to open up, you know, my career because it's, that's what I did at BAS. That's what I did at White Box. Like I, everyone wants and needs. That's, that's literally what everyone wants. But it didn't make me happy because, I mean, well, it, not that it didn't make me happy, but I do not enjoy operating from a place of deficit. You know, I don't like having to constantly beg for the money. And that's what grant writing is, is like, yeah, you're begging. You're, yep. you're doing it nicely, but you're begging. And it's like, I was like, hey, Kayla, so much of what you do is at the, you know, the behest of other people. I was like, there needs to be a sense of empowerment that's coming in this. So I was like, I had said, I remember telling a friend of mine, um, I was like, you know what? I'm tired of asking for the money. I need to get on the, the funder side of things. And I was joking, but then I was like, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's something there. Um, and from there, I just like, you know, started looking at the opportunities and the way they are presented in our field and started, you know, like looking at, hey, what does this job actually require? And that's another thing is that a lot of people will hear a title and they'll sell themselves short because they're like, oh, I can't do that. But look at the requirements. You're probably already doing it. Yeah, yeah. Like you're probably already doing it. So it's like, yeah. and listen, <laughs> and this is like a particular like, nod that I want to make for like two persons of color don't sell yourself short don't because just because you feel like you aren't there apply you know how many people I know are working jobs they are not qualified to do there's mm. so many we have a president who's not qualified to be the president yep. <laughs> apply for that job <laughs> get that yeah. job get that job <laughs> um and so, yeah, um, and as far as me working at the Department of Cultural Affairs, as I said earlier, a lot of what I do is really based in this idea of access. And so I was already kind of doing this work on a smaller scale. I was doing it when I was working in the Lower East Side at White Box and I was doing it in the Bronx and I was doing it when I was working at Carrie Abel Gallery. So it was kind of like, I'm still in this place of creating opportunity and, you know, facilitating and making connections. So why not do it on a larger scale? I'm qualified to do it. I've already been doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and just the funny way that life works. Prior to me taking that job, taking the job at um, Department of Cultural Affairs, I had went with my class, um, Harriet Senny, teaches public art at City College of New York. And you know, if you know Harriet, she also wrote the book on public art. So like, um, she took us to a panel and I met Kendall as a student and who would have thought that I would be doing this work a year later. So life is weird like that. <laughs> I actually have a question about books related to public art. There's a question here from the, the audience. Uh, are there any new books or even like a classic book that you can recommend about the role of public art and community engagement? Um, yeah, I would definitely say Harriet Senny's book is a great place to start um, because she really traces the, the history of public art and she's engaging and it, <laughs> she's engaging it in a really interesting way and um, opening that door mm. and learning like just like how like this this whole like field form will really influence the way in which you not only think about what can be public art because that's another thing public art can be a lot of different things 
Like you probably walk by a, a mural, you know, on your way to the train, that's public art. Graffiti is public art. You know, there are a lot of things that qualify as public art. So um, yeah, but that book really helped me and like being, you know, her student helped me and allowed me to really think about the impact and like, mm. like there's a mi macro micro impact that goes on and working for percent for art here in this, you know, this city, there's a global impact too. There's like an extra layer of scrutiny that makes me want to be great. But um, also just start with Harriet Senny's book, look at the works of Calder, move also there's an architectural aspect looking at the ways in which parks are created will help you figure out um you know new like avenues to explore when you're exploring public art also do you know that like you can go see public art every time you go to a cemetery mm -hmm. cemeteries are public art museums like yep. the statues there like yep. get a tour for greenwood cemetery it's the biggest cemetery here in new york city um, go visit your local cemetery if you're not in New York City and like you can literally trace yeah. um, the styles of sculpture like sculpture styles and you know things that go in and out of fad also like materials and like you know pick, there's a lot you can learn yeah Woodlawn so, is just two stops up from Lehman and I right, always Woodlawn. recommend I bring my students there which is kind of spooky but it's kind of amazing too so I love I love Woodlawn yeah, and it's a great, great look at like public art and literally just like, you know, styles and mm -hmm. these ideas of like how to memorialize something. Right. We, we all, I mean, we have, we have to go. We're out of time, sadly. Like I said, we were going to run out of time because there's just so much to talk about. But is there anything cool going on in the Bronx that we should be on the lookout for? Yes. Um, I am currently commissioning some school projects that are in process, so there's not much I can say about them. Sure. But I will say that if you have not had a chance to go see um, Paro Roberto in South Bronx, please do. It is a beautiful, beautiful work um, by M Melissa Calderon. And I love her as a person, but also she's super talented. She's super talented as an artist. And I think that is, in recent history, one of my favorites. It's because we talked about this and I was like, oh God, that's going to be so hard, like, you know, to figure out something that I really want people to check out. But actually, Melissa did a great job and she really captured not only what, you know, the function of public art, like, you know, on a larger scale, but also what it can mean to a community. You know, the South Bronx is largely Latinx. Um, Roberto Clemente is definitely a figure that, you know, should be celebrated. And also there's a sense of globalism in that piece too. There's, you know, all kinds of commentaries happening from, you know, this idea of colonialism and how people come to America, you know, there, there's so many different like things to engage with in that piece. It is so successful and I truly love it. Like it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Please check it out. Cool. <laughs> I actually, one, one last thing, our, our resident uh, art historian here at Lehman reminded me of a couple of things I think you might find interesting. There are 3% for art projects on the Lehman campus. Yes. I had totally forgotten about. Um. And I hope you will, you will, I'll put in a plug. If you are interested in Bronx public art, you should go to the Lehman. To the website, yes. Our, yeah. our website for, uh, that we keep on Bronx public art. Yeah, and also one other thing, um, apparently uh, we are for, former art historian in, in, in the arts department, uh, Sally Webster co-wrote Yes, the Sally book Webster with, wrote yeah. that book, right. Former with... colleague, amazing, amazing woman, still, still killing it. Uh, doing projects. Um, yeah, so uh, Kayla, thank you so much for, for sitting with us today. This is, I think we could do like another two or three talks with you and still have plenty to talk about. <laughs> Maybe we'll make it a regular. <laughs> we'll a regular see you thing. again for the panel. Right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. November so we'll 17th, you. right? That's right. And just to remind everybody uh, who's here, uh, there's a panel discussion on November 17th, which is just two weeks away. Uh, roughly in thereabouts, um, where we'll be inviting everyone back for a larger discussion. So 
Uh, thank you so much again. And thank you, Bart, again, for, for sitting in and, and, you know, engaging. And it was my pleasure. Thank you, Kayla. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you guys next week, next Tuesday. We're going to have another, the final talk with Sarah Jensen Carr, and we will be uh, moving towards the panel. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. And it's beautiful out. So go out and see some public art, and we will see you guys later. Thank Thanks you. So